بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله خالق الخلق باسط الرزق فالق الاسباح ذي الجلال والاكرام والفضل والانعام الحمد لله الذي بعد فلا يرى وقرب فشهد النجوى تبارك وتعالى الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا ان هدانا الله واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله اللهم صل على محمد عبدك ونبيك وحبيبك وخيرتك من خلقك وحافظ سرك ومبلغ رسالاتك افضل واطيب واطهر ما صليت على احد من العالمين وصل على اخيه ووصيه من بعده علي امير المؤمنين وصل على الصديقة الطاهرة فاطمة سيدة نساء العالمين وصل على سبط الرحمة وإمام الهدى الحسن والحسين وصل اللهم على أئمة المسلمين علي بن الحسين ومحمد بن علي وجعفر بن محمد وموسى بن جعفر وعلي بن موسى ومحمد بن علي وعلي بن محمد والحسن بن علي والخلف القائم الحجة المهدي أرواحنا فداه وعجل الله تعالى فرجه وسهل مخرجه وجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه والذابين بين يديه بإذن الله My dear brothers and sisters I was talking about the significance of deed, doing good deed in the Quran, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, every time he mentions our faith, our belief, he combines it with good deed. Meaning, a true Muslim cannot only claim that he has a good faith, rather he has to have good deeds as well. And Islam encourages Muslims to participate in good deeds. Never get enough of good deed. There is no limit on how much good deed you can have. The more you have, the better. In fact, our Holy Prophet وسلم, tells us that the loser is not the one who loses money in any business transaction or in the uh, market. He says the true loser is the one who does not accumulate more good deed every new day. Man tasawa yawma fahwa maghboon. If you keep the status quo and you do not increase in your good deeds every single day, you're a loser. By every new day, you need also to add in new good deeds to your account. And if you don't add in new good deeds, you're a loser according to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam. Now there are hundreds of good deeds we are encouraged to do. And you can do any of them. But there are some good deeds that are superior over other good, other de good deeds. So according to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wa Alaihi Wasallam, let's see what the Prophet, how he defines good deed. And what are the priorities in good deeds? Are there some good deeds better than others? He says, yes. <laughs> the best deed with Allah is سُرُورٌ تُدْخِلُهُ عَلَى الْمُؤْمِنِ a happiness you bring, joy you bring to the believer, to the human being. How? تَطْرُدُ عَنْهُ أَوْ تَكْشِفُ عَنْهُ By either filling his stomach with food if he is starving, or by helping him get out of his trouble. There is a human being who is hungry. By you feeding him and bringing joy to his heart, this is a deed that is so loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have a fellow Muslim, he has a trouble. Some kind of trouble. Whether with the government, with the court, 
with creditors. He wants to find a co-sponsor or co-signer so he can buy a house or a property and he cannot find someone and you can be a co-signer. This is a good deed that is, this is a deed that is loved by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is one of the deeds that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala enjoys seeing happening. What else? Imam Ja'far al-Sadiq alayhi salam when he was asked what is the best deed he mentioned a few one of them qala as-sala lamma su'ila as-sadiq an afdal al-a'mal alayhi salam qala as-salatu li waqtiha to perform salat on time on time do not delay your salah so for example now the dhuhr prayer is around 137 138 don't delay your salah till 7, till Maghrib. Don't delay it. Try to do it in the beginning of the time. The sooner the better. Meaning, do not be careless about your prayer. Do them on time. Be punctual. When it was time for salah, the Prophet becomes so edgy. That he looks at Bilal, his Mu'addan, and he says, Arahna biha ya Bilal. Relieve me. Let me perform my prayer. I'm so edgy. I cannot wait more. I'm excited. I'm happy to perform my prayer by meeting my Lord. So Bilal would go and declares the Adhan. What else? is considered one of the best deeds in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَبِرُّ الْوَالِدَيْنِ To be kind to your parents, to be giving to your parents, to take care of them, to fulfill their needs, to help them financially if they need financial help, to take them to the doctors when they need someone to take them to the doctors. When they become ill, you take care of them. Some parents, when they get old, they develop dementia or Alzheimer. What happens because they lose their long-term memory, and I'm sorry, their short-term memory, they forget. And because they forget, they keep asking the same question many times. Some people get agitated. He would tell his dad or his mom, you just asked me this question a few minutes ago. Why do you keep asking? Did you forget that he has dementia? Did you forget that he has Alzheimer? Sometime I have seen some elderly people because of their forgetfulness, they say things or do things and some of their children start laughing. Don't laugh. Don't laugh. You might be in their place in a few more years. If you happen to live as long as they lived. You may not live that far. But if you live that far, you may be in the same situation. You might be doing the same thing and say the same funny things your dad is saying and your children will be laughing at you. Don't laugh. This is not a time of laughing. Rather, be sympathetic and be understanding that this is a peak that you reach and then after the, the peak, you start declining. Allah says, after reaching your climax, your peak you shall go down. You lose your memory. You lose your appetite. And then this, will, this road will lead you to the, your final destination. This is the life cycle. There is no room for me to laugh at anybody. I could be in my father's place. And then on my mother's place. 
They no longer can walk on their own. They need someone to help them. You be the help. Because you might be in their situation. Don't brag about your, your physical strength. Your physical strength is nothing but temporary. When you become their age, you will lose your physical strength as well. And you need someone to rely on. So our parents, when they are young, they don't need us. When do they need us the most? When they become elderly. When they no longer can hold themselves. Sometimes an elderly person cannot control his, his ability for, for example, for urination. Some kids start laughing. Don't laugh. Don't laugh. You might be in that situation as well. They need our love and our sympathy and our understanding and our patience. Don't complain. My dad is too much. He has Alzheimer. My mom has Alzheimer. She's too much. Don't say that. You might be in their place as well. You might be in the same exact situation where others would complain about your own behavior without you even pay attention. The third one was jihad fi sabilillah. To do jihad. And obviously, the best jihad is to do jihad against yourself, to struggle with your own soul, tempting soul. My dear brothers and sisters, as I am concluding, I would like to touch upon two issues and then I conclude my khutbah. One is a sad event that took place, I guess, yesterday or the day before here in our community in which a young man, barely in his 20s, passed away, leaving a wave of sadness in the heart of his parents and his relatives and loved ones. And the reason for this death, as it was reported, it, it was a, an overdose of drugs. This is happening again and again in our community. So what does our community do about this? Nothing. We just go to the funeral. We offer condolences. And we may go to the cemetery to witness the burial. And then we come back and we forget about it again. Isn't that what we do? We just go and attend the funeral, offer condolences. Is that a solution? Is that really a solution? No, that's not a solution. To go to the funeral and show sympathy is not a solution. This is a sympathy you show to the, to the parent, to the family, but that's not a solution. We are looking for preventive solutions so these incidents do not take place as often in our community. What do we need to do? And how to prevent those events from happening, those very bitter incidents from happening? By taking full responsibility as parents. Many parents do not care whatsoever about their children. What they do, where they go, who they talk to, how do they spend their time when they go out of the home, who they talk to, when he comes late at 1 or 2 a.m., where he was until that time, none of that. They do not ask about any of that. They leave them alone. They let them do whatever they want. They don't check on them. The father is busy, most likely, in another basement somewhere in the community, having his own argila and his own sahara talking and the sun is somewhere else, and then all of a sudden the, these incidents happen. We need to take more, more of a responsible role in containing these situations. As a father, as a mother, I have a responsibility to guide my son and my daughter, to check on them, to basically supervise over them, what do they do? Who are their friends? 
When you go home and you see your son today, do you ask him, who are your friends? How many friends he has? Who are they? What do they do? When he goes with his friends for two, three, four hours, what does he do with them? How do they spend their time? Most parents don't even bother to ask their children. They just give them some cash and then they let them go out. And all of a sudden a tragedy strikes. My dear brothers and sisters, if we really care about our children, then we have to change our attitude with them. You can't just have your hands off. I'm not saying we should become dictators, no. I'm not saying we should go and become so nosy and interfere in their business and stalk them and chase them, no. What I'm saying is I need to take a more responsible approach by having some supervision, check and balance by having a dialogue with my kids. Many parents lack the dialogues with their children. They hardly talk to their children. They hardly. As a father, as a mother, I need to establish that dialogue with my kids. I need to earn their trust and their friendship. As a father, I need to be my son's friend. So if he is going through some difficulty, he would come and tell me. He wouldn't go and tell stranger because that stranger may not help him. I need to establish friendship with my children so if they go through some troubles, God forbid, they come to me before anybody else and they discuss it and confine it in me before anybody else so I can find them a solution can help them to wait, to ignore, to be passive, heedless, will not help the situation. Otherwise, we will see more of those very tragic events in our community in the future, which is a very heartbreaking situation, my dear brothers and sisters. We go, we offer condolences, some of us shed some tears, and then what? Then we go back to the same scenario. We go back to the same situation. Another issue I wanted to refer to my dear brothers and sisters and touch upon is something that happened overseas in Saudi Arabia. As you might know that the current Saudi regime started a new campaign cracking down on any voice criticizing the regime with the harshest punitive measures so harsh that the answer to any type of a criticism to the Saudi government is nothing short of execution beheading the style and there are some 48 people right now that the prosecutors in Saudi Arabia are demanding to be executed simply because they dared to criticize the corrupt regime of Saudi Arabia. One of those critics is a lady, young lady with the name of Isra El Ghamam from the city of Qatif. In December of 2015, she wrote some tweets on a Twitter criticizing the Saudi government, demanding more rights for her oppressed citizens. The answer was that she was put in jail. It's been over almost three years now for, doing, for not doing anything, for not committing any crime. On top of that, now the prosecutors in Saudi Arabia are asking that she will be executed beheading style. Only and only because she's, she criticized the Saudi government. 
I don't talk to the Saudi government because obviously they don't listen. They are not willing to listen to any criticism. But I wonder why our own government here being very hypocritical. Our government goes around the world and admonish any regime that is viewed violating human rights. And our government is very eloquent in admonishing other regimes who are suspected of violating human rights. Sometimes we go on and impose sanctions on those regimes. Only with Saudi Arabia. They can get away with anything they want. They can kill their critics. They can execute them. They can behead them. And our regime, our country, our administration would not say a word. Would not say a word. When the government of Canada dared to criticize the Saudi government, the Saudi government poured a wrath on Canada. We withdrew over 16,000 Saudi students, thousands of Saudi patients who were being treated in Canada with, were withdrawn from Canada, and they decided to stop any trade relations with Canada while the U.S. administration chose to be silent and not say a word. Is that fair? Is that fair that the Saudi government commits all those crimes and human rights violations and no one in the world dares to criticize them, to tell them anything, including our own government that is so vocal in criticizing other world governments when they violate human rights? Only the Saudi regime has this immunity. And you, you wonder why and how? Very obvious, very obvious. When they give contracts up to $450 billion and sign them with our own government, with our own U.S. administration, obviously the price would be that we keep quiet and we keep a eye, blind eye from all those their aggressions and violations, unfortunately. And our government is telling them and giving them the green light to go ahead and do anything they want, whether with their own people in Saudi Arabia or with people in Yemen, by bombarding them day in and day out. Over 10,000 people have been killed so far in Yemen. Millions of people were displaced from their homes in Yemen. No, no one says anything. No one does anything. No one tries anything to stop this catastrophe. We complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah al-mushtaka. We complain to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for those atrocities being committed against those innocent people in Yemen, in Saudi Arabia, in Bahrain. Hundreds of thousands of people were killed for no legitimate reason. Only because there was someone or some government financing those atrocities and those murderous operations. Allahumma ghfir lil mu'minin wal mu'minat. A'zai udhakkirukum. I remind you that next Friday, inshallah, we will be having Eid, the Maharajan Eid al Ghadir, the celebration of Eid al Ghadir here at the Islamic Institute of America at 6 p.m. Our guest speakers will include Samahat Ayatullah Sayyid Munir al-Khabbaz and Samahat al-Sheikh Tariq Yusuf al-Masri. So I encourage you to attend and to be in that celebration at 6 p.m. next Friday, inshallah. Allahumma ghfir lil mu'mineen wal mu'minat wal muslimin wal muslimat wa ahiyai minhum wal amwaat tabi allahumma baynana wa baynahum bil khayrat إنك مجيب الدعوات إنك قاضي الحاجات إنك على كل شيء قدير وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات ولشفاء مرضانا خصوصا المريضة المنظورة اللهم من عليهم جميعا بالشفاء والعافية ولشفائهم ولنتذكر موتانا 
الذين رحلوا عنا نقرا سوره المباركه الفاتحه بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر ان الانسان لفي خسر الا الذين امنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر you can move forward a little bit because there is still room in the front part of the masjid بسم الله